Okay, can everyone hear me? <laughs> oh, I love this. Almost instantaneous silence when I open my mouth. That is the wonders of a big fat microphone. My name is Wendy Kerr, and it's my absolute delight to welcome you all here tonight for our emerging tech stars talk at the University of Auckland. I have the pleasure to be the director for the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and our mission is to unleash the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship across everyone at the university. And we do this through hosting a range of experiential workshops, programs, and events just like this, so that we can broaden people's views about what being innovative is, how to be entrepreneurial, and what impact that will make with the New Zealand economy. So we're delighted that you could spend some time with us tonight. And I'd like to thank Naomi and Shrestha, who are part of my team, who have pulled this together. So we are getting involved in Tech Week. And for those of you who don't know, Tech Week is a week designed by New Zealand Tech. And it's a nationwide event. And it's designed to celebrate innovation and technology across all of New Zealand. And the reason why we love to get involved in Tech Week is because we're passionate about enabling students and staff to transform their thinking and build their entrepreneurial capability so that we can build New Zealand into a prosperous and creative nation. So we aim to entertain, educate and inspire you tonight. We have a fantastic lineup of six emerging tech stars from our labs in the University of Auckland. And they are a range of emerging academics, PhD students and researchers. They're going to spend a bit of time talking about what they're passionate about and how they make it happen and what they hope to do with it. And then once they've all spoken, we're going to have a panel discussion at the end, which I will facilitate. So I'd love you to hold all of your questions, of which I know you'll have plenty, right till the end, and then we can get everyone's views on what your question may be. So without further ado, let's introduce our first speaker. And this woman is passionate about blood splatter. So there's an opening line at a party. So Ravishka Athor, she is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Science. And she is working on understanding more about blood splatter at crime scenes. And of course, there is a lot of information within blood and of course how it's splattered out in a crime scene. And I know many of you will be casting your mind directly to CSI, and she tells me that it's a lot more sophisticated than anything you've seen on TV. So I'm delighted to introduce Ravishka to come up and share her story. Thanks, Wendy. At 0800 hours on the 24th of March, 2015, forensic scientists were called to the scene of a violent crime. What appears to be a normal house in the middle of suburbia is now the scene of a violent crime. Blood spat has been found at the outside of a house. And on the inside, a male, John Doe, in his early 20s has been pronounced dead. Severe blood staining has been found on the wall behind him and a potential weapon in his arms. The circumstances are suspicious. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my world of forensics and blood spatter. Thank you for being here and taking the time out of your day to listen to me um, tell you all about what I'm passionate about. And without further ado, why am I passionate about forensics? Well, you probably all know about these cool forensic TV shows like Dexter or CSI. And I just want you to imagine yourself as an investigator on one of these crime shows. Whether you're just like Dexter who likes analysing blood spatter or you're an investigator on CSI who loves to piece together the puzzle of a, um, that makes up a crime. Well, that's exactly what I used to do. I love these TV shows, and this was what inspired me to get into forensics. Now, you're all probably thinking, well, I could have just then become an actress and gone to Hollywood and acted in CSI. But actually, I was really passionate about the science because I knew that there was so much unknown information about forensic science. I was also inspired by cases like the Amanda Knox case and the Oscar Pistorius case, which tended to shed some negative light on forensics. And I wanted, that inspired me because I wanted to go into the backdrop of what forensics was about and really understand the science. 
So blood stain pattern analysis is the study of the shapes, the sizes, the directionality of blood stains found at crime scenes. And one of the jobs that a blood stain pattern expert does is to distinguish between different types of blood stain patterns. So as an example, we can see up on the screen here two different types of blood stain patterns that were found at crime scenes. On the top here we have arterial spatter, which is the result of a breached artery. And on the bottom, an analyst would classify this pattern as an impact spatter, so a force that's acted on a blood source. So as I said, the job of the expert is to be able to distinguish this. And at the moment, the challenge is that scientists, uh, sorry, analysts aren't being very scientific by how they're doing this. They're depending on their experience and their knowledge to guide them in this. And there's no real objective means of analyzing patterns. So this inspired me because I wanted to understand the science and develop a way of actually helping analysts be more objective. So in keeping with the theme of tonight, uh, technology has really grown, grown and um, in forensics at the moment what we use is high speed video technology. What you can see on the screen in front of you is a person coughing up blood. And high speed video technology is now used um, very actively by forensic scientists to give us information about how these blood stain patterns form. In my own research, I was really inspired by understanding what analysts actually do when they look at bloodstain patterns. And this was my idea to go along and use some eye tracking technology to, to capture analysts in terms of what they were looking at. So what you see on the right hand side is a recording of an analyst as he's looking at a, a pattern that I created in the lab. And I use this technology to just help me get into the mindset of the analyst. Now, as I said, technology is evolving and we want to help scientists be more objective at the crime scene. So part of my task was to develop a, an image processing based methodology that could help analysts extract information from a bloodstain pattern. I also wanted to use pattern rec recognition algorithms to develop a automated system that could help analysts actually do some of this work at the crime scene to help them analyze the pattern and classify these patterns into different types. So part of this process was to um, use image processing methods, so taking a pattern, removing the background, doing some measurements, and extracting some features like the impact angle or the area and other important information. And I found that my, my computerized method could actually do the job of the analyst. It could take a pattern and it could classify pattern, unknown patterns based on uh, examples. So I found that this was interesting because it sparked in me um, potentially something that could be commercially viable. So as you will know, um, we have existing 3D technology that's in the market. And I've really thought about um, incorporating my pattern recognition method with existing technology. So as an example, we've got a, an image here of a crime scene reconstruction. And I want to use my technology by marrying it up with uh, existing technology. So analysts can go to the crime scene, their, their eye movements can be tracked, and they can get immediate feedback about a pattern, whether it be the um, sizes of stains, the irregularity in stains. And I think that this could be potentially a powerful tool that can stand its ground in court. So as you can expect, there have been a lot of challenges going through this process of really analyzing patterns and coming up with ways of being objective. Technology for me has been a positive challenge. Um, one thing I had to learn was programming and I found that actually that was a very useful tool to learn because I was able to develop all these methods using a programming language. I found that there was resistance to change. I found that people in the forensic science field were, were unwilling to accept that a machine can do their job. But what I was trying to show was that technology is there to assist us and we've got to capitalize on that. Motivation, that can be a huge um, you know, barrier to us as we do our, in our research careers. And I found that being a researcher myself, I often had to take 10 steps backwards and look at my work from the outside perspective just to gain that motivation back. And finally, accepting that you don't always know what the right answer is. I found that as a researcher, people think that I know that how my program works or how things should be. But I think one thing that I've accepted is that I don't always know the right answer and that's okay. So my name is Ravishka Arthur. Thank you for listening and no humans were harmed in the making of this presentation.
Thank you very much, Raviska. That was absolutely fascinating. And what I was really pleased to hear you is that you shared your challenges. And often when we're on this pathway of innovation, there are many challenges and sometimes we don't hear about them. But I think that also helps us understand that we can overcome the challenges to create something truly innovative. So thank you. So next up, we've got someone who is passionate about sperm. And not just any sperm, but sperm from bulls. And this is a multi-billion dollar global industry that he's about to get interested in. So this is um, Peter Hosking. He is a PhD candidate and a project manager for Engender Technologies. And Engender Technologies is a very successful spin-off from the Photon Factory, which is one of our labs in the science faculty at the university. So Peter. Thank you. This is probably not the dream I had for myself when I was eight years old, but I am proudly passionate of sperm now. Uh, so the, the dairy industry is huge. Uh, in New Zealand, we have about five million cows right now, and last year we produced 21 billion litres of milk. Uh, one of the best opportunities for market disruption in the dairy industry right now is in sex selection, and that's because Every year, dairy farmers artificially inseminate their herd of cows, and if nature is left to its own devices, you're going to get 50% male offspring and 50% females. Now, the females, they're mostly used to replace the dairy cows, but the males don't have the same career opportunities. The <laughs> most that the males can ever hope to become is a hamburger, but, but the sad thing is, they're not even going to become the best or the tastiest hamburger because these males have been selectively bred using genetics that are best for dairy, not beef. And so, you know, as beef cattle, they're not very high value. But if dairy farmers were able to just flick a switch and have that determine whether or not a cow would give birth to a male or a female, then they'd be able to ensure that only high-value females were ever born. Okay, and this is where uh, Engender can offer a solution. So uh, Engender, as Wendy said, is a spin-off company uh, that I am currently working for, uh, and we are developing a microfluidic and photonics-based technology for sorting male and female bull sperm by sex. Um, there is one sole competitor to this technology, um, they've enjoyed a monopoly for the last few decades, but unfortunately for them, their technology is lousy. It's, it's very slow, it's very expensive, and most importantly, it damages the sperm cells. And so that lowers fertility rates, and as a result of all of those things, uh, the uptake in the market has not been very strong at all. Um, however, Engender has been able to design around the limitations of the competing technology. Um, and our chip-based design uh, is low cost, it's efficient, and it's very gentle on the sperm. Uh, so this is basically how it works. Uh, a very simplified schematic, obviously, uh, but it does show the four key steps that we've identified as being uh, sort of critical to make this process work. Uh, Everything you see here happens on a microfluidic disposable chip that fits in the palm of your hands. The channels that direct the flow of the sperm cells are about the size of a human strand of hair. Um, so anyway, step one is flow focusing. Uh, the cells enter from the left and they reach a junction where multiple uh, sort of sheath flow inputs converge on the cells and they separate them out and then sandwich them to the center of the channel uh, so that they're sort of lined up one by one, sort of head to tail in a nice thin stream. The second step is orientation. Uh, here, uh, bull sperm, they're actually disc shaped. They're, they're kind of like little frisbees with a tail and we need all of those frisbees uh, to be lined up one in front of the other um, as well as being, uh, well, as well as having the same orientation each time. So the, the, the flow focusing puts them one in front of the other. Orientation, they all have to have the same orientation. And that's critical for the next step, which is detection. And this is the part that's like obviously necessary. At some point, we have to know whether it's a male or a female. And the only way that anybody knows 
whether a cell is male or female, uh, is by looking at the DNA. Uh, this is for bovine sperm. Um, and, and so the male bovine sperm cell is characterized um, by a Y chromosome, and the female is characterized by an X. The X chromosome is just ever so slightly bigger than the Y chromosome. And so what we do is we stain the DNA inside the sperm cell with a fluorescent dye, and then uh, we take a UV light source, we illuminate the cells one at a time, and because the female cell has the slightly larger X chromosome, it glows with a little bit more intensity um, than the male cell. And at this point, we can do switching. So now we know whether it's a male or a female cell, we've got to do something with it. Um, all we have to do, actually, is just move the cell sort of up or down, up if it's a female so that it goes out the top channel, down if it's a male so it goes out the bottom channel. Um, and this is where uh, sort of Engender's core IP comes in. And actually, I've been remiss. I've forgot to point out that our core IP is also important in the orientation step. So I mentioned we have to orient them, and the way that we do that is to, get, is to use laser beams to uh, apply a force to the cell, so that, that, and that force just flips every cell one by one into a particular orientation. And it's that same physics that we use in the switching step. So we put a laser into the chip, and we use the force that that laser imparts on the cell to just nudge it, just by a few diameters, up or down, and that gives us enough control to ensure it goes out one of the selected output channels um, for collection. So I have a couple of videos I can show you. This one is a demonstration of the hydrodynamic flow focusing in step one. So instead of sperm cells, we've put red food coloring into the sample input. And this lets you visualize uh, what happens to the flow in the main channel. And so you can see the effect of the vertical uh, sheath flow channels sandwiching that red dye into a thin stream. And we actually have quite good control over its thickness and position. Um, in this Next video, uh, unfortunately what you're seeing is not sperm cells, I, I couldn't show any sperm cells or the board will have my guts, but I can show you uh, an, an old experiment that we did um, early on where we sort of simulated the effect of putting small particles into a light beam. And so what you're seeing here is, uh, is it, I might play again, the, the, the 10 micron particles, oh there we go, coming in from the left and there is a laser which is invisible but it's coming down from the top center of the screen and it's deflecting those microspheres one by one. And that's how we do the switching. So uh, Engender has uh, enjoyed already a fair amount of success. We've raised over four and a half million dollars in funding. We've partnered with two of the world's largest artificial insemination companies. We've also just recently signed a deal with the biggest dairy company in China. Uh, in addition to that, we were the winner uh, for the Ag Tech category in the Silicon Valley World Cup Tech Challenge. We were named one of the five most innovative international startups by Ag Funder and also named one of the most promising early stage companies by TIN 100. Uh, finally, any success that we have had or will have is very much the result of a team effort. Um, these are our fearless leaders, Brent Ogilvy, Jim Mervis, Mervis and uh, Gary Pace, and together they handle the business side of things. Uh, Kather, Professor Kather Simpson is the founding scientist and leader of the technology. And uh, last but not least, these are, this is the technology team. Um, these are the people I see every day. Uh, they're a joy to work with. Uh, they are a mix of physicists, biologists, engineers. Um, without their diverse range of talents, none of this would be remotely possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was absolutely fascinating. I think you'll all agree. And what was mind-blowing to me, and I think we're going to hear more of this in a minute, is how much one can do on such a tiny scale. And I think what you're going to do is going to transform the dairy industry, we hope. Thank you so much. Now, I have been remiss of not telling you what our social media um, strategy is for tonight. So we're on Facebook, and the Facebook tag is at... U-O-A-C-I-E, so that's at U-O-A-C-I-E. So if you want to post anything, follow anyone, then that's the place to do it. So our next speaker is passionate about tiny, tiny things. 
So Ankita Gongrotta is a PhD candidate and a nanotechnologist at the Faculty of Science. And she's really embraced how multidisciplinary research can be. So she reaches over physics, biology, and chemistry to create the work that she does. She's also really pioneering the use of basters, and as she's put it here, a tiny turkey baster, to understand what happens inside our bodies. And this will help us lead to the early detection of cancer and other disease. So thank you, Ankita. I'm going to try and use the mic and this and also demonstrate all of the stuff I have here for you. So I'll be, literally be juggling. But. All right. So I am a PhD student at the Department of Physics. Um, but I'm actually an electronics engineer by training. Currently, my lab's in chemistry, but I'm working on biological samples. So when someone asks me, what I do, it can be quite a tricky answer. But the common denominator here is nanotechnology. I usually say I'm a nanotechnologist and that I study the science of very small things. So my research is in the adaptation of nanopipetting apparatus for nano aspiration. And we love, as scientists, using really fancy terms but for the fear of losing you to boredom, I'm going to avoid using jargon. So what I'm trying to do basically is make a tool, make a technology, using very, very, very small objects called pipettes, which look exactly like this turkey baster here, only a million times smaller. And I'm doing this to aspirate or suck up very tiny particles. Now, I'll get right down to the point. When disease affects our body, it changes the mechanical properties of some of the cells in our bodies. So disease such as cancer, sickle cell disease, and malaria can make our cells stiffer, or it can make it softer. But there are parts of our body smaller than cells known as exosomes. These are about 100, uh, sorry, these are about 10 to 100 times smaller than cells. And they're basically packets of proteins that are exchanged between cells. Now, we don't know much about their physical or mechanical properties, let alone how they're affected by a disease. So through my project, we're trying to learn what these properties of these exosomes are. And eventually, we hope to be able to characterize and catalog them on the basis of this. And this is where my little turkey bases come in handy. What I'm trying to do, the idea is to first try and locate these <coughs> exosomes on a surface. And once they're located, apply pressure to try and suck them up. If, if they don't get sucked up, they're stiff. But if they do, they're squishy. So it's as, as simple as that. And now that you understand most of the basic concepts of my project, I'm going to show you exactly what a week looks like doing research for me, right? So Mondays, I'm usually really excited about going into work and doing science. And I go in and I have a meeting with my supervisor. I talk to him about what I did in the previous week and what I should be doing in the next week. Often, I fabricate my little nano pipettes. So I'm going to try and show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. Often, even I can't see it, but there you go. Um, and I fabricate these out of quartz glass in a machine uh, that fires a laser at the glass. It heats it up beyond its melting point and pulls it apart, making these little capillaries. And it takes about five minutes to make 10 or 15 of these. So I get to do that, but I also get to do some really cool things like design and 3D print objects for my lab. And my supervisor will be happy to know I also do a lot of reading. Uh, reading is a very, very crucial part of research as one always has to keep abreast uh, with the latest findings in their field. So Tuesdays, I usually spend over this table in my lab, hunched over this table in my lab, Wearing these gloves, and I'd wear it for you, but it's going to be 
fiddly with the mic, so I won't. Also, they make my hands really, my palms really sweaty and stinky, so I won't do that right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what I uh, usually spend such a day doing is I spend it trying to set up my experiment. I take these little pipettes and I try and align it. I get caught up in wires and I fumble and I drop it and then I pick it up and I see it's broken and I restart. And I get to use cool um, devices like a potentiostat and a piezo translator, but sometimes I also resort to using basic tools like a hammer. <laughs> so, so I go home feeling exhausted and tired, but I persevere. I come back the next day and I write code and I program and I try and collect data. And if I'm able to collect data, I try and analyze it. And I hope things are working. And if things indeed are working, the next very crucial step is writing up your results. So I write. And I draw graphs and charts. And I analyze and make sure that my results are repeatable and are consistent. And at the end of the day, when I'm done writing up and I'm ready to send it over to my supervisor, I feel pretty pleased with myself. But the next day when my report comes back with more red marks than white paper on the page, a lot of emotions go through my head. But mostly I feel sorry for my supervisor who has to read my terrible writing. And I have to write at least four or five more times to get it perfectly right to publish the paper. So that's what a week looks like for a researcher like me in the lab. Um, and while... Um, I mean, there are lots of ups and downs, but um, don't quote me on this number, but about seven, uh, sorry, 95% of the times, research and science doesn't work the way you want it to. But the 5% of the times that it actually does, it's totally worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was absolutely fascinating to get inside the day and the life of a PhD researcher, which I have just learned so much in that last five minutes. So our last speaker is coming up, and she is passionate about glowing bacteria. And how many of you have ever seen a glow worm? OK, so what we're going to hear about is that bioluminescence that emits from these organisms and how um, a business has been created around using glowing bacteria to help people learn about science in a fun way. So we've got Hannah Reid, who is a research assistant in the Bioluminescence Superbugs Lab, to talk to us. Hello. Hold that a little bit further away. Hopefully everyone can hear me. That's great, brilliant. So, as I don't actually have a name tag, so hopefully you remember the next few words that I say, which is, my name is Hannah. <laughs> and I am a um, postdoctoral researcher at the medical school. So I'm a microbiologist by training. Uh, so I work on nasty pathogens. So those are nasty little bugs which make people sick. So I'm going to show you some pictures, they're not quite as gory as the bud spatter ones, but there are some mice, so if you're a little bit, eh, whatever. Um, so what you can see here on, on the screen, on your left, you've got some mice which are infected with bacteria which causes food poisoning, but, you know, because that's what we do in our lab, we've made the bacteria glow in the dark. So those bright spots that you can see there are actually the bacteria that you can see from within the living animal. What you can see on the right there, because another thing that we do is we're looking to see if we can find new antibiotics. So the bacteria only glow when they're alive. So the ones which aren't glowing on that, so the ones you can't actually see, they're ones which have been killed by whatever antibiotic is being produced on that plate. So that's my day job. I use things which glow in the dark which is pretty cool, but unfortunately none of these things can actually come out of the lab, which is a real shame because, you know, stuff that glows is really cool, right? We all like stuff that glows, shiny things. So to help us explain these sorts of things to people, you know, in the public, 
in a way which won't actually make them sick because that's really, really bad publicity. We don't want that to happen. We went and found a naturally glowing bacteria from the ocean, perfectly safe. And then we can actually show that to people and do all sorts of cool things with them. First, I'll give you a little bit of science behind it so you can, you can learn something while you're here because that's good. So the bacteria produce an enzyme called a luciferase. And this luciferase needs a few things so that it can glow. So it needs a luciferin, which is a substrate. It needs oxygen. It needs energy. And then it will glow. And it also looks really cool. So it looks something like this. But pictures aren't actually that exciting, are they? How about we actually look at what they look like right here? Can we turn the lights off, please? More lights, please. Thank you. So, still on? Yes, yes it is. What we've got here is some glowing bacteria. It doesn't look like it's glowing very much, does it? That's because it needs oxygen. But if we give it a bit of a shake, <laughs> suddenly starts glowing again. Another one there. Ooh. Glows. Pretty cool. We've also got it on some plates here. Nice, shiny. Got one. And then in case you're wondering what it is, <laughs> it's a glow bug. And I'm, I'm not really much of an artist, but I had to do another one because we had these plates, so why not? I also made a face. Okay, we can have the lights back on again and stop bugging the camera crew. Okay, great. So that's what it looks like. It's pretty cool. It's pretty good. We can, we can take this out to the public. People can look at it. They can get excited about it. You know, you can have kids actually touching it, playing with it. So we've done some pretty cool things with it, including getting involved in wearable science competitions. So this is myself when I had much shorter hair and a couple of my colleagues wearing essentially Petri dishes, so those plates, all over our bodies. That's what it looks like in pretty dim light. <coughs> this is what it looks like when we actually turn the lights off. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. So it was kind of, it was pretty heavy, you know, it's not very practical, so I wouldn't really recommend wearing this, but it looks pretty, pretty cool. So there's a few other things that we've done with this because, you know, we can actually show this to people, so why not do some exciting things with them? So people who are actually artists have worked with these plates and drawn things like you can see on the top left-hand corner there. So we have these um, temporary art exhibits where we'll get artists involved, they can draw on these petri dishes, and then we can have these displays because the plates will glow for about two days and then the bacteria get a bit tired, they stop glowing and the light goes out. So these temporary displays. We've also had people who are illuminated by the light of the bacteria can take photos of them, it looks kind of cool. We've also done some 3D printing. So what you can see in the bottom, bottom right there is some 3D printed squid which we filled with this bacteria and so they glow, they look kind of cool. And then we've also done obviously a lot of educational stuff. So because it's so safe, we can have kids playing with it so they can learn about learn about bacteria, realise it's not quite so scary, and it actually looks pretty cool. So we've done quite a lot of things. This is not a complete list. You'll notice that it stops in 2016, and we've already done stuff this year. Um, so a lot of different things, a lot of experience that we've gained from it. So we've learned quite a few things, like we've learned that those glowing 3D printed squid actually leaked, which, is what, which was not that great. So we needed to actually cover them with a lot of glue so they didn't leak. Um, those large Petri dishes, which are quite heavy, sticking them on the wall, not actually the easiest thing to do. But, you know, you live and you learn. What we consistently got from this, though, was it's safe, it's cool, people like it. Why aren't we selling it? Why aren't we actually making some money out of this? So. What we started off doing is we started getting the involvement of the artists who had been making these, pic these beautiful pictures and then saying, okay, can we actually sell you know, artwork and things? Can we sell T-shirts and stuff which has got these things on? So we've had this red bubble thing going for quite a while where we can sell 
pillows, T-shirts and whatnot. But we, we can do better than that. So recently, this year, we've started up a company called Brightons. I think it's kind of catchy. I hope you agree. And so what we're looking at doing now is actually selling. Selling the bacteria in these little kits. So each of these little kits contains bacteria, petri dishes, instructions, information. So educational stuff involved in them as well. So the people who use this, not only is it something kind of cool and a kind of unique gift, but it's also hopefully teaching people. Which is important, we're at a university, come on. So that's what we're currently doing, but you know, we, can, we can do so much more with this. So the applications here, things that we want to do, we can look at providing street lighting, providing lighting for buildings, tea lights. We can look at seeing how safe it is and seeing if we can put it into food, making glowing birthday cakes, glowing makeup. Pretty much anything you can think of, we can make glow, and that'll probably make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was really, it was illuminating, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> um, I was absolutely enraptured by that because there's something so wonderful about the combination of science and art and creativity and then being able to use that as a tool to educate more young minds about science. So from the dark, we now move into the light and we've got Daniel Zhu who's going to talk to us about UV. And obviously the issue for us in New Zealand is how strong it is and the... Um, the impact of that on our skin and our health. So Daniel is passionate about tech and growth and we know this because he's been part of the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship over the last few years as a, a participant in our student entrepreneurship program which is called Velocity. So he has dev devised a new business which is called UV Lens and it uses sensors and algorithms and all together on an app to enable people to be more warned about what's happening in the sky and how it will impact them. Thanks, Wendy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Daniel. Um, for the last couple of years, um, I've been working on my PhD in um, tech, tech engineering, but at the same time, I've been trying to grow a startup company. Um, so I thought today I'll kind of share a little bit about the insights of um, trying to manage the, both of them, both from an academic perspective and also trying to be quite commercial in our focus. Um, so when most people think about academia, um, research, we think about people in lab coats or doing science experiments, um, but actually it's more like this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do spend a lot of time um, sleeping, catching up on sleep, and part of it is um, we, we get really passionate about what we're doing, um, working really long hours trying to solve problems. So in a way, it's very similar to working in a startup. Uh, my PhD was working on a technology, um, a wearable sensor technology, um, essentially it was used to measure your human body motion for um, athletes. Um, we're training athletes to be more efficient. Um, we're using it for healthcare rehabilitation. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, the intellectual property perspective of the university, and partly is because we have a very um, uh, we have a very uh, different approach in Auckland, um, and one that's uh, very rare in the world. And essentially, it means that students own the IP. Um, and it means that if you develop some technology as a student in your PhD, you own that intellectual property. And from there, you have a couple of options. Um, you could choose to commercialize that yourself, um, or you could go through uh, the university commercialization agent, um, Uni Services. Uh, it was one of the things that I did with the patterns that we did. We licensed it to a, um, a wearable company called um, StretchSense. They've got about 50 employees now um, doing really well. Um, so in, in your spare time when you're working on your research and you're not, sleeping or lifting weights or so, um, there's a lot of time for exploratory side projects. And that's kind of how our business got started. Um, me and my co-founder Ming, who's here tonight, um, we entered into a technology competition run by Microsoft. It's the world's largest student-led technology competition developing solutions aiming at big global problems. And the one about um, sun safety, about people getting skin cancer was the one that we wanted to tackle. So we developed this wearable wristband that captured how much ultraviolet you're getting throughout the day and give you um, notifications on your phone when you've had too much sun or in cases when you haven't had enough sun we tell you to go out and get a bit more vitamin D. So 
We started off doing that. Um, the app has now um, got a user base of over 70,000 users. We were featured on the New York Times. Um, Apple selected us as one of the top apps um, featured on the front store of 87 different countries. We've now moved away from wearable technology and actually use a network of sensors. Um, here's Maine putting one up. Um, it's got a whole bunch of weather station sensors on it from rain, humidity, temperature. It's got a solar panel on it. Um, so we use a network of these sensors and also other um, IoT sensors to form a really good database of what the UV, like, UV is like throughout um, the world. Um, along the way, we've had to really prototype really quickly. So here, here's um, a couple of um, midnight drawings we did on a whiteboard. Um, the next day, it was really important for us that before we built anything, that we would go out and test the market. And this is one of the things I think um, research could do a lot more, is testing out whether or not there is a commercial um, proposition out there. So I quickly painted um, uh, the whiteboard drawing onto um, Microsoft Paint. Um, I phoned up a, a whole bunch of pre kindergartens or preschools, which we thought were our first target market, and we were doing interviews the next week. So we were out there um, driving all around Auckland, talking to teachers, trying to figure out what, are, what is it that they like, um, how would they use something like this, how much would they pay for something like this. And we had all of that um, data before we even built, wrote a single line of code. Um, we found a commercial partner, a sunscreen company, Banana Boat, sponsored the first 100 of these kits to go out into preschools. Um, we then went on to secondary schools in the next year. We, we've put um, 50 of these up around the country. Um, here's, um, one of the really cool things was going back to my old high school. And, and I'm a proud Mags boy, um, so first sensor number one was at Mount Albert Grammar. Um, Ming, who um, installed a whole bunch of these, is also our um, videographer, and he, he's um, uh, our, our drone pilot who captures all of the videos for our um, uh, media. Um, so along the way, there was a lot of technical challenges that we had to solve. And one of the things we realized was a real scaling issue. And this was, we were, we were at the day, right, this is 20, 2014, I think. We, we were building hardware um, in the lab ourselves. So Ming wrote all of the software. I designed the PCBs, and we were assembling these like middle of the night. And this is one of the things we realized that we could not do what we're doing and export to the rest of the world. There was just no way that we could scale what we're doing um, and sell it overseas. And it was, it was one of the things that kind of really piqued our um, thought around what, are we, what, what is the kind of business that we want to build with, with, with our capabilities. Uh, and we started looking more into software and we started looking more about how can we build something that we could ship global from day one, that we could, we could um, push a button and someone on the other side of the world can use. So last year we created a, um, a, an image recognition chatbot. Um, essentially, it's um, a plug-in on Messenger, Facebook Messenger. You take a photo of anything you like, like that beer, sir, you're drinking, um, and the, the, the bot could figure out what exactly is in your photo. Um, we, um, we quickly hacked together a prototype. Um, we had um, over 10,000 people come on board and use this. It was featured on the magazine Wired. And it was, it was really a thought experiment for us. It was trying to, we were trying to figure out what can we do with very little money um, in a very short amount of time. <coughs> Um, we're, we're now currently working on a couple of chatbot ideas and um, AI, so come talk to me afterwards if you're interested in this area. Um, over my time being really quite closely with the university, um, I was quite fortunate to be given a chance to go over to um, Stanford University to do more about entrepreneurship. Um, and I think um, if, if you imagine what this is, it's, it's essentially startup weekend um, and an MBA, and you squish that down together in a month, and then you have this course. So I spent a month over there um, um, working on a couple of ideas, um, developing this chatbot, but also getting a taste of what it's like in, the, in Silicon Valley when people are living and breathing startups every day. And I thought I'd take the rest of the, this presentation and share some of the thoughts I learned. So the first thing was that people over there really understand this idea of scale. And it's, it's not, it's, we're not trying to, they're not trying to look for problems that only a few people have. They're trying to do true global problems. Um, and the night that I came back to Auckland, I was actually at a software um, uh, networking event and a couple of people were pitching for money. Um, and one of the things that um, really struck out for me was in their business plans, um, they were having revenue projections and a couple of million dollars in the first or second year or so. And I thought, yeah, that's, that, that's cool, but um, this is something that the guys in the US just don't even touch. Um, we, when we were brainstorming ideas over in the US, um, we were looking at things that we weren't, we weren't going to touch anything that was the rule under 100 million. And, and that was the kind of scale that people over there think. So really I want, I want us to think more about what can we do, what are some of the bigger problems that we can solve. 
And I think being here at the university is, is a really good place where we can leverage some of this technology, like nanotechnology or sperm counting, like sorting, right? This is stuff that like, has big potential. So think about scale. The second thing is really about how to move, like moving really, really quickly. And we thought we were doing this already. Um, we, we were making prototypes before we were um, building any lines of code. Um, we, were, we were getting upfront payments from customers before we even like, sold it to them. Um, but really, like, over there is a complete different story. Um, one example was a design thinking class we did where literally in the space of four hours we would build prototypes out of cardboard and like polystyrene, that kind of stuff. And then we're out in Walmart talking to customers, doing interviews, getting price like analysis data coming back. Um, and it was that kind of like four hour turnaround that we're trying to get feedback. And I think that's something that um, academia or research could do a lot more of. I think traditionally we've been holding too long onto our projects. We're, not, we're almost not failing fast enough. So in a way, we've, we want to move for more aggression like they're doing in the US. So I want to leave with this idea of um, trying to summarize what I've seen in both academia and working in the business sense, is that in, in science and in, in engineering, well, in science, we're often looking for things that are universal truths. We're looking for things that are like, if you look at a landscape, it's the tallest peak out there. It's the thing that is absolutely true, and it's like the perfect data we're trying to chase after. But it's really slow to get there. Whereas in business, we're often looking for what we call temporal truths, or things that are like a small peak that we currently have that we can leverage and really use that to build momentum. So we don't necessarily need to find the absolute, the best the thing right now. We just need to get something going where we can launch and really get some quick feedback. So that, that's something to think about. I think um, having gone through a lot of this stuff is, and hearing other people talking, like um, getting some feedback has inspired me to come back and share some of my learnings. Um, two takeaways from today. One is um, there's, currently there's a um, University of Auckland Inventors Fund. There's a $20 million fund designed to uh, fund support projects around the university. Um, there's, been, there's going to be a new committee. There's going to be a student-led committee um, that looks at student projects, student ideas. So. If anyone has got an idea that they think could grow into a business, um, please come talk to us. I've been fortunate enough to be offered to chair the meetings. Uh, the committee is going to be consist of a whole bunch of students, PhD students, um, so you're in a really safe environment to come pitch your ideas. Two is um, if you're looking, if you're working on chatbots or AI or anything with machine learning, natural language processing, come come talk to me. We're we're interested in doing that in our business. So uh, lots lots of career opportunities. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. And what an absolutely rousing call to arms that was, which is great that you are our last speaker, because I think what you'll see from Daniel's journey is it's, it's been a, a journey that's emerged and changed and evolved and also done that at pace. And I really agree with what Daniel's saying about the new student committee for the, um, the, the Uni Services Inventors Fund, and that will be a safe environment. You've got ideas and you want to see if they can go to the next level. But before you get even there, is I've got two ads to say, and then we'll get on to our panel. First of all, if you do have an idea and you're thinking about, could this be something, could I take it somewhere, is that Velocity is running their innovation challenge right now. So if you have an idea that you can articulate in under 1,000 words, which I think you'll be able to, you will then be judged and you could win a prize of $1,000. So the entries close next week, so you need to really move with that if you are interested. And secondly, the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship really runs a Masters of Commercialisation and Entrepreneurship degree. This program is a part-time course, it's 18 months, and what it does is it gives you the tools and the frameworks to commercialise your science and your research. But as well as that, you get to meet a lot of practitioners. So every week we have talks from people in the business community, people who have set up businesses and professional services firms, so that you're able to link the leading edge academic theory with what really happens out there. And the Capstone Project is a chance for you to deal with some very tough IP and to see what you can do to bring it to life and to commercialise it. So if you are interested in that, come and see me or my team or visit our website because we have an information session for that next Tuesday.